So I'm going to be talking today about um, a planning and dissemination project that I've been involved with for about the last two years. Um, and it's focused on indigenous mental health and substance use. This is the sort of final report out of this project. We do have a preliminary report that's available. If you, if you look at the draft report here, um, there's a document identifier in this information if you want to look at the preliminary report, but it's just really an earlier version of this report. So uh, thank you for the um, traditional acknowledgement of the lands. Um, I have actually given this acknowledgement for all of the presentations that I've done in the communities as well, just to acknowledge that um, I'm working at Royal Roads University, which is on the traditional lands of the Kwisapsum and Lekwungen people. And I also just want to start out by acknowledging um, who paid for this work. So the initial sponsor was the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, who provided a planning and dissemination grant for this. And that was uh, matched with internal grant funding from Royal Roads University, mainly to pay for travel so that I could visit all of these First Nations communities. And then some of the communities and um, health authorities also helped out with a little bit of funding for additional honoraria or for food so that more people could attend the meetings. The leadership of this project has been, um, I, I've, I've done sort of most of the sort of traveling and visiting, um, but Asmanahai Antoine and Nadine Charles um, have also, and the Heron people have also provided leadership to this project, particularly sort of in the early days when we were just sort of developing the grant application. Um, you probably all know that um, Nadine um, sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago and uh, so unfortunately um, isn't able to be here today. But I do want to acknowledge that uh, she was very involved in this project at the beginning and the final report is dedicated to her. These are other elders who were involved in the project in all of the various communities that I visited. So there are quite a lot of them. And a couple of communities, um, specifically Haida Gwaii and Shushwap, had a lot of interest from their elders. But we did have elders in attendance at all of the um, communities that we visited, or that I visited. And we also had lots of students involved in the project who also attended the meeting, many of whom were from Royal Roads University, and some of whom were indigenous, and also from other universities around the province as I sort of traveled around. So that was great having them involved. So the rationale for this project is the recognition of the very high rates of mental health and substance use problems that exist among indigenous peoples that we have known about for about 40 years. But these problems have typically shown up in statistics as, as getting, if anything, getting worse. They've started to get a little bit better over the last couple of years, but um, that's sort of since, since this project began. Um, but in spite of all of this, the health system has only very recently moved towards taking action, specifically around indigenous mental health, with the development of and creation of the new First Nations Health Authority in BC, which is the first of its kind in the world, um, and also the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's work that has kind of exposed many of the problems that indigenous people have experienced over the last few centuries. And um, there's certainly a need for more collaboration or for some collaboration between health authorities and indigenous health leadership. This really became very apparent to me when I was working at the Ministry of Health for about five years as their resident psychologist. And I was advising on mental health policy uh, when I looked at where the biggest problems lie, they lie among indigenous peoples, but we have uh, very little collaboration actually looking at what culturally appropriate um, treatments would be, how to prevent um, mental health and substance use problems from developing among indigenous peoples, and um, just generally there's, there's just a gap in terms of the, the dialogue there. So the intent was to develop an opportunity for that dialogue across the, the health authorities in BC. 
Um, so the objectives were to engage with indigenous communities to build collaborative relationships for research, to empower indigenous people to fully participate in the research process, and to engage with the health system, including the First Nations Health Authority, the regional health authorities, uh, provincial health services authority, who are kind of overarching health authority, who provide some services for very severe mental illness in BC, the Ministry of Health, and some of the nonprofits that are involved in providing services on the ground. The outcomes are to develop a plan for indigenous health leadership research, including looking at the scope of what needs to be done, priorities, particularly what priorities indigenous people themselves have around mental health and substance use, and what kind of knowledge translation would be helpful to reach some consensus on what people's roles are and to develop an ongoing program of research in the Center for Health Leadership and Research here at Royal Roads. So through the engagement process, we started with Asma and myself meeting with the Heron people and discussing what this could look like. Um, we also reached out to um, people in the health authorities who have leadership roles for mental health and substance use. Um, one of the most powerful um, ways that we engaged with communities was through our indigenous students. So um, I was often you know, approached or engaged with students who were on the MA Leadership Health Specialization Program as well as the MA Leadership who were interested in doing research in their own communities and it was particularly action research looking at supporting mental health. Um, so that was very helpful in terms of you know, they were inviting me to visit their communities, so it, it made it a lot easier for me to actually come in and, and facilitate these dialogue sessions. Um, a lot of the challenges came from, uh, from, help, from within the health authorities. Um, overtly, the message was very much that they wanted to do this work, that they wanted the engagement to happen, but when it actually came down to organizing events, um, there was uh, typically some resistance and a lot of passivity as well. So yes, that's a great idea, we'll follow up, and then there would be no follow up. Um, one of the challenges was that people often didn't see this kind of work as in scope for their position. So they might say, well, like in interior health, well, Leslie Bryant is our indigenous lead. So go through Leslie. So the first meeting that we had in the interior region, Leslie was the only member of the health authority who attended the meeting. And Leslie had already established a relationship with the First Nations people. So, you know, we got more engagement later on. Um, and that was mainly through Leslie doing the work. So, you know, this is often what happens. It also often happens when we have an indigenous person who's employed in a specific role to do indigenous health or indigenous relations, that everything falls to that one person to do the work. And they're enormously overstretched and they can't possibly do all of it. So that's something that kind of came up. Of course, that lets everybody else off the hook because they say, oh, well, it's this person's role, so I don't need to do it. So I think part of my messaging later on when I get to recommendations is just recognizing that it's everybody. It's in scope for everybody. And certainly in the health system, it needs to actually be written into people's job description that it's in scope because unless we do that, people will assume it's out of scope for them. There's also a lot of anxiety that exists um, in people who are working in the health system around doing this kind of work. And this is starting to now show up in the literature. Um, it certainly showed up when Asma and I did some research together. We, we had some uh, world cafes um, at one of the uh, provincial conferences where there were lots of non-Indigenous people who were very, very much wanting to attend and find out what to do. But when it came down to them actually doing the work, there was a lot of anxiety about that and a lot of fear of doing the wrong thing, offending somebody, some kind of misstep, or just fears around, you know, stereotypes around Indigenous people and what that work would look like. So there is a lot of anxiety that, that actually played out in this project as well and created barriers within the project. So even people who were working in the system and were indigenous and it was part of their role, there might still be anxieties there. So around bringing people together and what, how that might reflect on them and um, 
typically it resulted in a shutting down of things happening, cancelling of meetings, or we decided not to move forward, or we need the right people at the table, and then it was never very clear who these right people were, or nobody actually invited them. So, so that, that kind of discourse. And there was definitely some apathy as well. It wasn't um, expressed as an overt negativity most of the time. Sometimes it was, but most of the time it was just simply this, uh, you know, the problem's too big, uh, somebody else either is taking care of it or needs to take care of it, and I just don't have the bandwidth to take it on. Um, or, or maybe not even recognizing it as that important. The things that really facilitated it were those pre-existing relationships or those relationships that, that, that my role at the university really helped to create. So the, you know, the Heron people, asthma, um, the indigenous students, and then the relationships that people, some of the people in the system already had with indigenous people, that this provided an opportunity for those relationships to be strengthened, which was great. So the first community I visited, I'm presenting them in the order in which I visited them, just in case you're wondering. Uh, beautiful uh, Haida Gwaii. Uh, this is a photo I took. These uh, painted canoes were around, and I just went up and photographed one. So, um, and I also visited in the middle of summer, so it just looks absolutely idyllic there, and it was. Um, I was made to feel very, very welcome in Haida Gwaii. Uh, my student, uh, Lauren Brown, um, who's the health director of the health center in Skidigat, invited me. She actually invited me before she knew about this project, and her parents are elders, and um, they, they treated me extremely well. Um, when we came together and talked about what kind of mental health research would be important to people in that community, they kept coming back to the role of elders as what was really important to them. Haida Gwaii has, um, has a culture and a community that goes back thousands of years. That's not the case with all of the communities that I visited, some of whom had been relocated from other places. Um, hi, Asma. Hi, welcome. Um, we've, we've actually not been going that long. We've mainly just done the background of the project. And I'm just talking about my first visit to, to Haida Gwaii and being welcomed into the community there. Um, the elders played a very important role in the Haida Gwaii community in terms of addressing problems in the community. And a few years ago, um, the elders had, um, had an opportunity, they got some funding from the health authority to come together and have din dinners. I think they did this for about six months where they had dinner together and they talked about challenges in the community. And they saw this as the most important next step that they could take in addressing some of the mental health problems that they had in the Haida Gwaii community. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how that would work for a grant application for a mental health project, but I, I kind of took that message back. And they were going to address, they felt that they could use these dinners as an opportunity to address complicated issues around informed consent, ethics and cultural safety, which were all kind of discussed um, during, the, during the meeting, and there's a bit more detail in the report if you're interested in that. And so we, we did actually go ahead and apply for the Shirk Reconciliation. There was a special call for reconciliation grants, and we did actually receive that grant. So, so Haida Gwaii received 50,000, we, we've received $50,000 to support them in having these elders re, re bringing together the elders' dinners and inviting senior members of the health authority to actually join them and build relationships over dinner and talk about some of these challenges um, that they experience in the community. These are some of the other projects that they talked about. So one of the things that they felt was really important was helping people in the community to understand what mental health issues really are about, um, that there's a lot of stigma and a lack of knowledge about mental health, and um, they felt like uh, they could, we could do a project together focusing on educating the community. And they also felt it was really important to um, to bring in the Haida Gwaii language, music, and dance um, to develop culturally appropriate approaches to promoting mental wellness, 
and also treating mental health problems in the Haida Gwaii community. They also identified a need to introduce more therapists and therapies into the community. They weren't actually talking about um, Western approaches to therapy in a negative way. It was more like, well, we just don't get these therapies. We don't get offered them, so we don't know what's effective. We don't know what would work and what would help. So if we had more therapists here, if we had more choices in therapies and more people um, who are providing these supports, we could then do some evaluation and we could then kind of help to develop and, and shape what culturally appropriate therapies would actually be for us. And then they also talked about um, how it, when we're actually conducting research that we should include the presence of a healer or a psychologist or an elder or some other support person who we compensate, we the researcher compensate, hi Davina, um, for their role in supporting the research participant. And we actually, when we, when we have moved on and, and applied for other grants, we've included that additional support. And so the next community that I visited was in the Fraser Health region, and it was the Seabird Island community, which is part of the Stolo Tribal Council. And this is a photo that I took when I visited last year for my returning meeting um, when we had the wildfires. And people in that region couldn't get away from the smoke, so it was, it was everywhere. You can see a bit of smoke in the air there, but it was inside buildings. There wasn't any air conditioning, and so... There was a lot of anxiety about how that was going to impact the health of people in the community. So uh, this was again really led by one of the graduate students from Royal Roads University, Lolly Andrew. And Lolly has been um, working, sort of leading the substance use uh, treatment services in Seabird Island for quite some time. She's just recently opened two recovery homes um, in the community, on the reserve, which is a huge shift um, for what's available to people there because previously they had to actually leave the community to get this kind of support. And then it was very, very difficult to come back and reintegrate back into the community without relapsing. So she developed these two uh, new recovery homes. Um, she did that as part of, part of her leadership project, or her leadership project helped to um, provide her with the action research on which to base that work. And she also, when I returned, was in the, pro in the pro process of building a third recovery home for families. So she's really been moving forward um, with that work. And we got a good turnout at that meeting from Fraser Health Authority. We had another student from Fraser Health who was not indigenous, who'd driven all the way from New Westminster to, to participate. And um, so uh, Fraser Health have worked well with Seabird Island historically. Seabird Island is one of those communities that doesn't have a very long history. Um, it was created by relocating people from other communities. So the people there don't have as strong a sense of a cultural identity as someone like Haida Gwaii. Um, but in some ways they kind of talked about that being an advantage because maybe it was easier to collaborate with, uh, with the health authority. The health authority was certainly very open to coming in and working and being part of the dialogue and working on new ideas. Um, so I think there was a consensus between the First Nations people and the Health Authority people that it would be great to have some further resources available in the community for people around I mean, substance use was the main thing that was talked about. Um, so as well as the recovery homes, if we could just take it a step back and provide a detox service so that people didn't have to leave the community to access detox and then come back into the recovery home if it was all sort of in the community. And Fraser Health were very interested in working with them to develop that and look at evaluating what would be culturally appropriate in terms of detox. I, I don't know what people know about um, substance use treatment, but typically detox or medication management facilities are, are not, um, not a very trauma-informed and culturally safe experience for any clients. They're often very, um, a very um, uh, unhappy time for people. Um, 
and the system hasn't necessarily provided ways of making that a good experience for people. So when people have to leave their community also and then experience racism in those um, services, it makes it even more challenging. So this is something that we were kind of working on when I was at the Ministry of Health, and we, we actually developed some guidelines for detox, and some of the guidelines were uh, published, the ones for youth, but the, the adult ones weren't actually moved forward. So um, I think we need to do some more work at a provincial level, uh, just around detox generally. Um, and there's also a piece around the continuity of care. So this point about being integrated into the continuum of care is that if somebody goes into detox for one to two weeks and they come out with all of the substance removed from their system, but none of the psychological help or the cultural supports or anything in order to remain abstinent, their risk of dying from an overdose actually is greatly increased because they don't have the physical resistance to the drug that they had before they detoxed. So if they relapse one time, they could die more easily than if they had just continued to use. So this is something that um, is known about in the substance use system, but in BC, we just don't have good integration of services. So um, we talked a lot about developing an evaluation framework, because I think both the health authority and the people of Seabird Island felt that you know, it, it's more about evaluating what's already available and then tweaking it than necessarily coming up with a whole new way of doing treatment. A lot of the people who have substance use problems in the community have already accessed services and you know, perhaps somewhat benefited from them, but you know, there's, there's just a really long way to go. They so did talk about developing um, and piloting the evaluation framework in the new recovery homes. As far as I know, that hasn't happened yet. They're still kind of working out all the details of just setting up and running the recovery homes. We also talked quite a lot about expanding prevention initiatives. Um, if you're interested, if you take a look at the Seabird Island website, they've actually done an amazing job of documenting their history and a lot of the work that they've done over the years, more broadly, not just in health, but in um, things like education, things like putting a daycare into the high school to reduce the number of um, teenagers that don't finish high school because they get pregnant when they're young. Um, and they've also developed an ECE training program, which is apparently really effective, has a very high graduation rate, and people come from all around to, to take that ECE program to learn how to provide culturally appropriate childcare for indigenous children. So, so they've done some really amazing work in that community, um, and they really want to expand that. Um, they currently have things like a soccer program that's just run on a voluntary basis to try and give kids alternative activities to get involved in. But they do recognize that that's going to have a fairly narrow um, level of appeal to the kids that are interested in learning soccer and that kind of thing. And they would like to um, expand it and find out what other activities the young people in that community might like to do. And we also talked about the role of language re revitalization and traditional activities like hunting, fishing, drying fish, gathering berries, um, in promoting mental wellness and educational outcomes for youth. Lots of people had experienced doing those traditional activities and really feeling very um, supported and grounded by that in terms of their mental wellness. And then some of the things that have come out of this, uh, Lolly and I um, presented at uh, the pre presented her research at the Public Health Association of BC conference last November, and we're also collaborating with Lauren Brown from Haida Gwaii on a chapter in a book about um, community health centres in Canada, which is focusing on um, how these two Indigenous students have put culture at the centre of the um, health centres that they run. Oops. And so the next community that I visited was in the interior. And this is a photo that I took um, just about a month ago when I visited. And we had that cold snap. And as I left, I was told, oh, it's five degrees outside. And then I got to the interior, and it was like 30 below. So the, the river was frozen. So this is a photo of the drive-by picture of the frozen river, which was 
quite incredible. There were frozen waterfalls as well. So um, we had an amazing attendance by elders, and we had even more elders the second time that I visited. And this was the place where we only had the one health authority person the first time. We got more, I think we got three or four the second time. So um, starting to get more engagement. I know at least one of those people was uh, in an indigenous specific role though, so it's great that they've created another one, but just sort of back to that point of when a person is hired to do, you know, to be responsible for an indigenous role and everything falls on them and then other people don't see it as their responsibility and don't show up. So um, I think it's getting better, um, but very, very slowly. So they talked about a couple of projects in detail. One project that, and, and these were things that, that had already been done on a voluntary basis in the community. Uh, one of them was to build on work that had already been done um, with young men in the community. So there was a lot of concern expressed. We had a lot of male elders there who were really concerned about young men um, getting into drugs and not having positive male role models. And some of them, you know, not having, um, father figures and not, you know, not, not having positive um, experiences of, I guess, rites of passage to, to manhood was probably the best way to talk about it. Um, and they wanted to, and they're already doing some of this on a voluntary basis, but they wanted to develop something a bit more formalized around youth, young men, um, being mentored by older men in the community in traditional hunting uh, techniques, methods. Um, and for this to be a rite of passage for them. And they also talked a lot about how, you know, they could feed their families if they could hunt and, and that kind of thing. Um, the second project idea was based on traditional medicines. So the, the going out into the land and identifying, gathering uh, traditional medicines. And um, so we, we worked together for about a year trying to get a grant application together for this. And about, we had about three different starts that never got completed. So there were, there were a few things that kind of interrupted that process. Um, part of it was, you know, I could draft the grant based on what had come out of the discussions, but there were certain pieces that I really needed from the community, especially around timelines and that kind of thing. And it was just very difficult for them to um, to do that because, I mean, some of the concerns around protocols and around um, uh, doing the right thing and that kind of thing also impact people in First Nations communities. So even when I visited a month ago, there was still a real lack of clarity on what the protocols really were for being able to do a grant application and who permission should be sought from and that kind of thing. So. Um, they did think, though, when they got the preliminary presentation, that what they were doing in Haida Gwaii might be a good thing to do in their community as well. So because they have such strong involvement from their elders, um, if they could get some kind of funding to bring elders together, perhaps with health authority leadership, to discuss this and, and work this through, that that might be a good first starting point. Um, and so we're just continuing to explore um, funding possibilities. Um, Leslie Bryant's actually, uh, her role is also to help with research funding. So she, she works for Interior Health on facilitating research funding um, for specifically focused on indigenous health. Um, so I think we'll sort of get there eventually, but it's just interesting that they're very engaged, but there are just still these barriers that have kind of got in the way of being able to, uh, to be successful in getting funding for the community. And then this, this community you probably all know, if you, you've probably driven through it on the way up to the airport, um, the Seat First Nation and Vancouver Island Health Authority. I took this photo a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, down by the water at the end of the day. And so in our first conversation, there was just lots of discussion around um, child welfare. That was just a major concern within that community. Um, part of it was that we had a student from the Ministry for Children and Family Development who's also on the leadership program. And she works, she's not indigenous, but she works with uh, the Cowichan community. 
um, as a child welfare social worker, and she's also trying to um, really facilitate and support keeping families together and keeping Indigenous children with their parents. So she's really been focusing on that, and she's doing her thesis in that area as well. So, um, so that was kind of what she brought to the table, and then people within the community were saying, yeah, this is a real issue for us, and talking about the kinds of experiences that they'd had with children being taken or being forced to give children up. And I don't just mean a long time ago, but, but pretty recently. Um, so we talked, and we, we also had people from representing the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions as well, because they're actually local to this region, and they were incredibly supportive of these research ideas. So uh, that, was, that was a really positive uh, experience of bringing together health system partners and First Nations people. Um, we also um, talked about, you know, in quite a bit of detail what the project might look like and how we might work with parent-child dyads if a parent was at risk of having a child taken due to mental health and substance use problems and what kind of supports could be put into the family and just following up on the, the, the health and the well-being of both the parents and the children. And we talked about therapy being available for all of the participants and also the researchers and the elders who could be affected by the very emotional nature of this work. We talked about having a two-year extension so the families could be supported for a longer period of time maintaining, uh, ma maintaining custody of their children and then assessing the long-term outcomes for parents and children. Um, then within... Um, Island Health, there's been another project that we've worked on that's kind of concurrent to this one, uh, which you might have heard of, the Destin Project. And um, this, uh, this work has been done in, started anyway in Port Alberni with the West Coast General Hospital and the New Chance people. And um, Vancouver Island Health Authority was already working with that community before we were invited to support it with a project grant, which we did get a couple of years ago and two of our students, Eunice Joe and Heather Hastings, have been leading this project. And we, Asma and both of those students and I, um, presented where we were up to back in November in the Healing Our Spirit Worldwide Eighth Gathering in Sydney. So that collaboration is continuing with the Health Authority. And then the last community that I visited was um, in Vancouver Coastal. And I decided for this one to visit the urban indigenous people of the downtown east side. Because that, in that area, I'd already done some work with them in the Ministry of Health. And in that area, there's just such an extreme level of need and such low resources available that it just seemed like it was really important to give those people a voice. So I connected with, I also connected with Vancouver Coastal, and we, we had some of the same obstacles that I've talked about before around setting up meetings and getting anxious and counselling them and that kind of thing. Um, so where I ended up was um, working with the PHS Community Services Society. So they used to be, PHS stands for Portland Hotel Society. They used, they used to be known for providing the very low quality housing in the downtown east side. And they've increasingly been involved in mental health and substance use research and, and looking at quality of life and, and helping to support people. Um, so I visited a place called the Drinker's Lounge, which is in a community center in the downtown east side. And it's just right outside this park where lots of people go to drink illicit alcohol. Um, Illicit alcohol is um, non-beverage forms of alcohol. So things like uh, Listerine and rubbing alcohol and things like that. And um, people, people drink illicit alcohol not just because um, it's cheap and easily available. They also drink it because it has very profound numbing effects. Um, and this is a, a very highly traumatized population of people. So what they've been doing at the Drinker's Lounge is um, essentially running a peer-led microbrewery. So these are people who are reformed illicit alcohol users who now um, 
work in a kind of semi-professional capacity um, making beer and wine. And then they sell it and, and the uh, PHS Community Services Society provide a little bit of funding to help them with this. It's a, it's a harm reduction approach where they sell it or exchange it. So people can either pay a very, very low amount of money to have a daily in, intake of alcohol, of beer or wine, or they can actually just bring in a bottle of Listerine or, or rubbing alcohol and exchange it for a bottle of wine or a bottle of beer. And they also run other harm reduction um, strategies, like they go out to the parks in the summertime and they distribute uh, water, bottles of water to people because people are at great risk of dehydration during that time and they give them sunscreen and things like that. So um, it's a bit of a mental leap for a lot of people to, to think of this being something that the health service should be providing. And I think it needs to really be viewed in the context of what's available right now rather than this is an end goal, this is, this is what we should be doing. One of the things I found really reassuring when I uh, first connected with Russ Maynard, who's the PHS Community Services Society staff member that, that told me about all of this is, you know, when he was showing me around Insight, he was like, we don't want any of this. We don't want to need this. But right now, this is saving people's lives. So this is what we're doing. And that was so reassuring to me because I think sometimes people misunderstand and think that people who promote harm reduction actually want to give people alcohol or drugs. And that, that's not what it's about at all. It's about keeping people alive. Anyway, back to the, the research conversation. There was, there was actually a lot of enthusiasm from um, people who were part of the community who had got to the point where there were mentors in running, or they were sort of managers in running this microbrewery. And uh, they were sort of mentoring younger people. They might have been abstinent themselves, or, or they might not. Um, they, had, they had groups there that were for people who were what they call sober-ish, because if they actually required people to be sober, nobody would be able to show up. So a little bit of a different way of looking at abstinence than a lot of other alcohol and drug services. And they talked about really developing the capacity of peers who are already providing leadership in the program to provide further mentoring and peer support. It's really difficult for someone like me, a psychologist who has you know, not experienced the kind of hardships that these people have uh, experienced to go in and empathize, really. You know? um, whereas somebody who's actually lived through it and is a survivor and has actually somehow manage to get themselves to a place where they're able to mentor other people and support other people in a healthy way is much more, much more likely to be taken seriously and, and actually provide some real support for someone. This is also a difficult point for me because I've always advocated for professional services for people and that peer support is often, and particularly AA, is often used as a substitute for evidence-based therapy. I still think people need evidence-based therapy, but when you've got people who are marginalized, street entrenched, homeless, drinking bottles of Listerine, the reality is that those services for one thing aren't available and for another thing might not be meaningful to them at that point in time might be meaningful to them in a couple of years if they've been able to you know, make a really uh, different um, route in their life and go through detox, etc. But for right now, in terms of keeping them alive and keeping them engaged, um, peer support was seen as the thing. Something else that Russ said to me was that they'd had a meeting at one point and they brought people together in the community and then they brought the same people back together a year later, and about half of the people who'd been there originally had died in that year. So this is a, this is a, a community where there's a, just a very, very high level of mortality, and it really needs to be seen in that context, because all of these people, not only having experienced tremendous trauma in terms of how they ended up on the downtown east side, they're experiencing ongoing trauma through their close friends dying on a very regular basis. So, but they were very inspiring because they have actually had a couple of things develop. One was this group, Culture Saves Lives, who are indigenous people who volunteer to bring culture to indigenous people who are disconnected from their home communities. 
And so they provide drumming, smudging, and various other um, culturally appropriate activities that are open to everybody. You don't have to be sober. You don't have to be a member of that specific community. And they attended this meeting, and they were drumming, and they were singing, and, um, and it really was very inspiring and you know, brought a real sense of hope. Um, they have their own meaningful stories of, of how culture has helped them through difficult times. Um, so there was Culture Saves Lives, and then there was also this play, Illicit, which I personally haven't seen, but a group of these people had um, created a movie or a play about um, their experiences on the downtown east side and their experiences with illicit alcohol. And they've actually performed this in Victoria, Vancouver, and Kamloops, I think. And, you know, I hope to, to see it sometime. But they were talking about how much they would like to make this into a film that could be mandatory viewing for anyone who's going to work in that community as part of their knowledge translation strategy, which, as I said at the beginning, is part of what we were hoping to get to through this work. And then one more health authority was the Provincial Health Services Authority. Are you heading off, Roland? Bye. Um, these are a couple of the places I visited. Provincial Health Services Authority covers the whole of BC. Um, the place on the left is the uh, Colony Farm, sorry, Colony Farm um, Forensic Psychiatric Hospital. So this is where, where people go when they're um, not criminally responsible for very severe uh, crimes, killing people, that kind of thing. Um, and then on the right is the Burnaby Centre for Mental Health and Addictions. And that is, uh, I think, the closest we get to an inpatient facility here in BC for psychiatric problems. People can stay there for about a year. There's only about 100 beds for the whole of BC. Um, and typically, they're people who have I think in order to have access, you, you have a severe mental illness, so you know, a psychotic disorder, something along those lines, a severe mental disorder, criminal involvement, and homelessness. So, so all of those things, um, or, or somewhere on the dimensions of all of those, in order to get access to, uh, the Burn to a bed in the Burnaby Centre. And then they provide really intensive trauma-informed therapy there. I know some of the psychologists that work there. And, and this was created just not that long ago, just about, I think, seven or eight years ago. So I visited those two locations, and then I also visited the PHSA head office. And the indigenous people who attended, there were mostly indigenous people who attended the first meeting, they were all people who were employees of PHSA. So we had a lot of discussion of what it was like to be an indigenous person working in the health system and the kind of racism that they experienced. Um, some of you have probably taken the Sanyas training, which was developed by PHSA. And that's, uh, it was called Indigenous Cultural Competency when I took it. And uh, I think they now call it Indigenous Cultural Safety. I know that Asma brought it to Royal Roads and it was offered. It's an online facilitated eight-week course. And during that course, um, people are asked to disclose to the facilitator um, an incident of racism that they've experienced or witnessed. And so over the 10 or so years of running this program, PHSA has amassed a huge number of incidents detailing racism that's happening in the health system. And so one of the things that they were interested in doing, and they've already started some of this with another graduate student, but to actually do some analysis of this and provide feedback back to the health system, the health authorities about, these are the kinds of things that people are experiencing. These are the things that people are reporting right now. And to actually take up some follow-up action. So one of the things that's really difficult about this is we have such a shortage of healthcare providers in BC, particularly physicians. There's a lot of fear that, you know, if it's perceived that anybody's pointing the finger at these physicians and saying that they're racist, that they're just going to go away. They're not going to provide us with services. So there's this sort of balancing between needing to address racism in the system and needing to placate physicians and other healthcare providers. So we had a lot of uh, conversation about that. 
We also talked about referral pathways. So another thing that really stuck with me, when I, when I went to Colony Farm and I met with Tonya Nichols, who's, the, who's the, um, one of the people who, who runs the program up there, she said, yeah, we, we don't get a lot of indigenous people here at, uh, at the forensic hospital, and maybe we should. And I thought, that's a bit racist. But then as we talked, I realized what she actually meant was the system doesn't refer people to Colony Farm. They're just all, all put in jail. They never get the opportunity to get that not criminally responsible outcome when they've committed a serious crime. So they don't have the advantages of being at Colony Farm. It really is a beautiful place. It's a, a very supportive environment. It's very safe. And yet, most of, you know, when I've been in the jails here, they've been full of indigenous men. And then you go to Colony Farm and she's saying, yeah, we don't get a lot of indigenous people here. So, you know, there's something around the referral pathways and people actually getting access to things that have been put in place in the system to help people. So we talked a lot about um, an ex exploratory study looking at referral pathways, and that came up again in the Burnaby Centre as well. But yes, they do get a lot of indigenous people at the Burnaby Centre, but it's not reflective of the number of indigenous people with mental health and substance use problems in BC. So they're still underrepresented. Remember, it's only 100 beds. So, you know, it's not, not a lot of space for, for anyone. There are other issues around Burnaby Centre as well. It's predominantly people from around Vancouver that get access to that. It's supposed to be a provincial resource. But if you live in Prince George or Haida Gwaii or somewhere like that, how are you going to get that? How are you going to stay connected to your community? So they were some of the questions that came up. And then we also talked about ways to, um, to access those specialized uh, mental health services in an indigenous, culturally safe way. And then finally, we talked about um, people with severe cognitive deficits. So this would include the kind of people I met with at the downtown east side um, and people at the Burnaby Centre and other places where people have really been very severely impacted by, by violence, trauma, substance use and mental illness. Um, and um, they're not able to function in a way that allows them to benefit from some of the therapies that require the kind of high level mental facilities that everybody here in this room would enjoy. So for example, there's an approach to treating psychosis called cognitive behavior therapy for psychosis. And I learned about that when I was at the Ministry of Health and really tried to promote this across the health authorities. But what I heard was they've actually discontinued that in the Burnaby Center because the people who live there, who are staying there, have died an average of seven times before they get there. So their brains are not able to function in a way that allows them to be able to do cognitive behavior therapy. They've got to be able to analyze their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And a lot of them just aren't in a place where they can do that. So what kind of therapeutic interventions would be helpful for those people, would help them to function, would be able to help them live satisfying lives and, and not necessarily be on this recurring cycle of um, you know, crime and imprisonment and then homelessness that, that we see happening. So I'm just getting to the overarching messages. I'll try and wrap up quickly because I know some of you might have questions. There were three big messages. One is that there's a lack of access to mental health and substance use services for indigenous people across BC. Whether you're looking at the on-reserve communities or the urban indigenous people, those services aren't available. Um, there's a lack of those services for the population anyway, but it's particularly um, problematic. Like, for example, I'd go to a community, they would have one half-time counsellor to provide all the mental health and substance use services for the entire community, all of whom are traumatised, and many of whom use substances. So that's a key message. Another key message is around trauma. We hear a lot about historical trauma, about residential schools. That's definitely part of the picture. However, Indigenous people are experiencing trauma right now on a daily basis. So 
that needs to be understood and we really need some trauma-specific services. Uh, and a lot of uh, health authorities are working now on trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed care. That's really just about helping staff to understand how trauma affects people. It's not actually providing services to those people, treatment services that they need. And the other one was about the importance of culture and healing. It was a key message that I heard in every community from Haida Gwaii through to the downtown east side. It's not typically part of traditional therapy. I have to say, as a psychologist, culture has never really come into it. It's all about the brain, the behavior, those kinds of things. For indigenous people, culture is really important to healing. So the recommendations, I'll just go through quickly to ensure that every First Nations community has access to primary care, specialized psychiatric or psychological services and the full continuum of substance use and addiction services. Financial support and oversight to the health authorities in implementing recommendations and developing research plans and expanding access to trauma-specific services in addition to trauma-informed care. And the recommendations for the health authorities are similar. Ensure that First Nations communities and urban indigenous people within their regions have access to the full continuum of mental health and substance use services. Shorten and simplify the process of accessing services. It's ridiculously complex. And if people have brain injuries and things like that, it's just impossible. A named point of contact for indigenous research within each health authority. And that doesn't mean that that person's responsible for it. It means that if I want to do research, or Brian or anyone at any university wants to do some research with indigenous people, which we should be doing, they know who to contact. And that person can link them with the right people. Also, protocols to ensure respectful engagement with both indigenous communities and researchers being made available to researchers so that people can get past that anxiety they have about doing the wrong thing. Staff orientation and mandated training regarding historical and current issues affecting indigenous people. And I know we have the Sanyas training. I kept hearing we need more than that. Include working collaboratively with indigenous peoples within the scope of all employees' job descriptions and develop and implement policies and processes for the prevention of racism. And then feedback for the funders, specifically the CIHR. Increased research funding to support development of culturally appropriate services for indigenous peoples. Develop alternative non-competitive models of funding so that when people who are part of First Nations communities want to access some funding for a recovery home or a detox or whatever, they're not having to compete with their neighbors we should be able to provide funding for all of them to have it. Include travel expenses in funding models to facilitate relationships and trust. The most time consuming thing for me on this has been trying to find funding from internal grants so I can actually visit the communities that I've promised to visit um, because it wasn't part of the planning and dissemination grant. And develop more flexible timelines for funding applications and for research to be conducted because we kept hitting that roadblock around timelines. Next steps, I'm going to be presenting this report to the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions and continue to support communities through collaboration on research funding applications.